Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet Radio Show. Tonight, I have a special guest back on the show. I have Tony Demolition Man Dolan. Welcome back, Tony. Hey, how are you? And it's good to see you. And uh, well, good to see you. I'll see you after, but it's good to talk to you anyway. And it's good to be here. It's been too long, too long. It has. I'll tell you, the last time I spoke to you was back when you and Jeff and Anton were like sitting on the couch in Prime yeah. Evil. <laughs> yeah, I know. It feels like a, it feels like another lifetime. We were much younger then. We were foolish, <laughs> both of us. Me, you. We were just so foolish. We were carefree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were just kids back then, Tony. You're yeah, right. <laughs> Well, now we're responsible citizens. I don't know what happened, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds good. But anyway, so anyways, <laughs> so, you know, you did the primeval thing, then the empire yeah. of evil came about, and now you've come, like, full circle yeah. back to yeah. Venom with an ink. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what happened, like, you know, with the primeval, then the empire of evil that led up to actually forming Venom Inc. And I'll just sit here and drink my wine while you tell us. <laughs> okay, that you get the easy bit. Okay, that's brilliant. Well, no, it, it, you know the thing. It, the thing was, it was really strange because the idea of doing the band with Anton and Mantis came from them doing a show, and and playing black metal live. It went online, and people started going, "Oh, you should get the Demolition Man back." You three, that would be kind of cool because we, we, the three of us, hadn't done anything together. So that was the idea spawned, and we we kind of agreed to do it there. Um, we, you know, we chose Primeval because of the Primeval album that I did with Venom, uh, and then there was some problems because there was a band in New York called Prime Evil. There'd been one in California and I kind of didn't want to uh, copy another name and I, I kind of knew the band um, Mary from, who was a bass player from the band from New York and but the guys were determined that that was the most popular album, that was the name we should... Anyway, long story short, um, I, I, we ended up changing it and I just uh, used the letters of Prime Evil to for an anagram and came up with Empire Evil which people loved and hated at the same time. But the music was important. We went straight out and did an American tour, which Anton didn't feel so good about doing. So we pulled in a guy called Mark Jackson. We, we did the first tour and then we went from there. And we were quite happily sailing along, doing the albums. I was licensing them and we were just playing tours everywhere, you know, from Japan. Mexico, uh, obviously America, Canada, and we were just happily doing our thing. And then I did a show um, in the north of England as a special uh, invitation. I did an album, uh, uh, I did a whole album uh, called Future Warriors that I did released in 1985 with my band Atom Craft, a three piece. And uh, they asked if I'd do a special performance, so I did because I'd never played that album before live. Mantis lived in in Newcastle where I was doing the show, so he was coming to rehearsals, just hanging out with us. And then he uh, said, "Oh, I really love this song," and I said, "Well, put the guitar on and play the song with us on stage." So he did, and um, uh, we did the show. It was fine. He played a couple of numbers, and then a week later, I got a message from a guy in Germany. He said, to my, "Hello, Tony. My name's Oliver." I run a festival called Keep It True. We have about 2,000 just over diehard fans. And, and I was at your show with Atom Craft. And you got Mantis up, which I thought was great. And did you know Abaddon was in the audience, the original drummer from Venom? And I, I said, no, you know, I, um, I, I kind of, you know, knew he was around, but I, I didn't know he was watching. And he said, well, I just crossed my mind. What would happen if Abaddon came on stage and also joined you guys? And... Um, you know, what would that have been like? And I said, I, I've got no idea because it will never happen, you know, because Venom's always a car crash. They can't stay on the, <laughs> on the rails for long enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, look, you know, if I booked you as Empire, you and Jeff to come down and play my festival, and Abaddon just happened to be there, what's the chances that you would get on stage and do four or five songs for the crowd, you know, just Venom classics? And I said, you know, um, I, 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 you know, I don't think that's going to happen to be true, truthful, Oliver, because, you know, we're busy with Empire, we're doing a new album, and we're mid tour. And he said, look, please, please, make, if you, you know, if anybody can make it up, you could. And I said, look, if you want, if you really wanted a kind of Venom thing, why don't you just get Kronos to go do it? He's still doing his thing, and he, you know. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. He had certain views on 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 Conrad, and he said it was all about money. And he and he's not, you know, not my words, all of us. But he said he wasn't genuine. He said it wasn't real. And these fans are just into the music, not the politics. And he said, look, I really want you guys, if you can make it happen. So I said, well, I'll ask, but I can't promise. Mm -hmm. So I called Jeff, and I told him the idea. He just said, no, absolutely not, no way. And then. <laughs> 
I thought, okay, this isn't going to work. So I called uh, Abaddon, who then said, yep, sure, I'm up for it. <laughs> so then I went back to Jeff and I said, look, you know, what's your concern? And he said, you know, uh, we're using drummers now in, in, in Empire that, that are more technical because today's, you know, uh, technical styles, particularly with percussion uh, and drumming, are very different to, to the old school, which Abaddon is very old school. And I said, yeah, but you're misreading this. First of all, this is just for fans of the music. This isn't that we're going to have a band. We're just going to go play four or five songs for them, have some fun, sign a load of albums, take pictures, and then go home. That's all we're doing. It's just for this special event. And so once I kind of said that, you know, we, we play it as old school. We don't try and be technically perfect. We just go put the energy in and have some fun, play with our passion, just enjoy ourselves. So eventually we all agreed and we went there. Me and Manchester flew in from uh, uh, Russia, I think it was. Uh, Abaddon flew in from England. We met after, it was 25 years for me, 20 years for them too. Uh, we basically just said, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, it's all cool. Talked about the four, four or five songs we were going to play. We went on and played our show, switched drummers, Abaddon came on and everything changed. Yeah, everything changed. It was like... It took us by surprise, and by the time we finished the show, the people were going crazy. <laughs> and, you know, we had a signing session, it was supposed to be 20 minutes allotment. An hour and a half later, we were still there signing stuff, and the promoter was going, man, you've got to stop. And I said, look, as long as there's someone in the queue who wants something signed, we've got to sign it. That's why we're here. Um, and then the next morning, my phone was going nuts. <laughs> we had offers to play everywhere in the world and promote as agents. I guess someone had put it on YouTube and, and people thought we were a real band. And I was struggling to convince people we weren't a band. We just did this for some fun. <laughs> and so we went to breakfast and I just said, look, guys, I know we were just going to go home. Um, and that was it. But this is what's happening. What should we do? So we all thought, well... You know, we don't have a record company. We don't have management. We don't need to do it for money. So I guess we could just say yes and just go and have some fun playing some music. And that's what we did. And, you know, two and a half years later, here we are with an album out. We've been around the world two or three times. We're set to start uh, the New World Tour in Philadelphia on the 1st of September, which is going to take us through five weeks of touring Canada and all over America and then continue around the rest of the world. And it's quite astonishing to us, but you know, it's all because of fans. The, the reason we're doing it is because of fans. They wanted us to do it. They picked the songs we did. They've pushed us all the way towards a new album and they've, they've demanded that we make some new music. So we feel absolutely stunned that it's happening. Uh, but pleased and very honoured that, that, that the fans are so have been so incredible that they've wanted this to happen. So we're just sitting there and enjoying the ride right now. So when did Nuclear Blast pick you guys up? Well, John Cezula, you know, John Cezula is an old friend of mine from Megaforce and responsible for, you know, Anthrax, early Anthrax, Metallica. And uh, he actually took Venom to New York. He was the first person to take Venom into America. And, of course, Metallica was the opening band. Um, <clears throat> along with many others, Chromags, uh, Overkill, and uh, Anthrax included, Slayer, you know, all the, they were all just coming up as young bands. And um, and so he's been kind of like hanging around all the time as like just a guru, a voice, a friend, someone in the distance. And um, a year in to what we were doing, I realized that, you know, we couldn't stop touring. And I was thinking, wow, this is... This is kind of getting out of hand because I thought we were going to do it like 12 months, 15 months, and everybody go, brilliant, that's great. Now you just can go back to wherever the fuck you came from. But it didn't happen like that. And so I called John and said, you know, he'd relocated from Jersey to um, Florida. And I said, John, I, I need you. I need you to manage us. And he said, I told you I'm retired. I'm not doing it. And I said, OK, but I really need help, you know. And he said, well, you know, if you've got anything you need to ask, just call me up. Anyway, we ended up playing uh, Orlando last January, uh, and um, he sent somebody out to see us, uh, who went back with a great report, and then a few days later he called me and said, okay, everybody says you're good, so okay, I'll manage you, what do you want to do? And I said, just help us with the live stuff and, and merchandise, and we just want to keep playing live, that's it, really, no albums, none of that. But just before Christmas, he called, he said, right, I need demos now. Everybody's asking for albums, and I need you to produce demos. And I just said, look, you know, I don't want us to get into that, because if we get into that, it's all about 
criticizing and, and selling and, and making money and then agents and then labels and then arguments and artworks. And I mm-hmm. said, Fuck, we don't need that. We're just about the music and the fans. But he said, look, I need the demos to do it. So <laughs> we presented him four songs. And he said he loved them. And he said, okay, who am I going to send them to? And I said, oh, here we go. And now we've got to decide on labels and go through all that waiting and do they like us and wait for someone's approval. And I said, I really don't want to do that. And he said, pick a label. And I said, well, if I had to pick a label, I think it's got to be Nuclear Blast because I have an association with them, uh, Yap, uh, who works out of Europe as an old friend of mine. I, I like the fact that the label was about musicians who set the label up to to correct all the things the corporates were doing. And it's about their passion for their music. They really believe in their bands. They really uh, invest in their bands. So I said, if, if I had to pick one label, then I think probably Nuclear Blast is our home. So he said, OK. So those were the only people who got uh, some the demos. And I thought, you know, well, well, the album that me and Jeff did for Empire of Evil Crucified was on the table with Nuclear Blast the year before, or two years before, and it almost got picked. There was five bands and we lost out down to the last two and we didn't get picked. So I thought, well, maybe I'm hedging my bets, but they may be interested in what we're doing. So we sent the demos off to them, or John did, and... Three days later, he said, okay, they said, get in, make the album. We signed the deal, it was done. <laughs> and that was like, oh, shit, now it's real. <laughs> so it, it was as simple as that. It was, it was, I swear to God, it, it was almost like the, it was like a jigsaw where all the pieces were floating around and they all fit and they just fell onto the table and made a picture. It, it, it seems like it was that easy. Of course it's not easy, and I, and I wouldn't have an ego to think that we're uber special or anything. It just, we were ready, and everything fit, um, probably because we didn't plan it, probably because we weren't trying mm-hmm. to make anything happen. We were just doing it, and uh, maybe that energy made it all work, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was it was great. It was great. So when the three of you guys sat down to start writing this stuff, I mean, what was that like? I mean, here you all are again, more or mm. less Venom. And it, I, mean, I mean, what did that feel like for all you guys? And, and well, it, you know, it was strange because normally with a band, you would be, you'd be rehearsing all the time. You guys would be in a room. And certainly if you were thinking of recording, you'd all present ideas and work together and, and mash it all around. And then you'd fine tune it. And then you'd have your last things and then go and record it. But of course, Mantis lives in Portugal. I live in London. And Abaddon lives up in the north of England in Newcastle. So we don't have time to rehearse like regular bands. We don't meet together all the time. So, uh, you know, from a writing point of view, we couldn't do that. Um, so basically it was a case of pulling out all our riffs and ideas and seeing what we had. So I decided to commit to the artwork. So I focused on the artwork, uh, the scripting for a video uh, and all of that kind of stuff, the logistics, whereas uh, uh, I said that Jeff got the task of just producing riffs and trying to produce songs. And I said, when you, I'll send you some stuff when, uh, when you feel unsure or when you feel you've ebbed a little bit or you come to the bank and you need a little bit of push, then I'll start to send you stuff. But Everything he sent, I saw. I saw straight away. Everything he sent, I liked. Uh, and um, halfway through, he said, "You know, is it working for you?" I said, "Perfectly. Just keep sending the riffs," because he spent two and a half years collecting riffs <laughs> that he'd been all the time. So I said, "Just keep sending your material." And he said, "But well, you haven't sent me anything." And I said, "I don't need to. Everything <laughs> you're doing, I love. So just keep sending it. I'll focus on what I'm doing. You focus on that." And, and when we, when you get stuck, we'll discuss. But he also then said, I'm just concerned that I'm going in the right direction. And I had to say, look, in order for us to commit this album, it needs to be what we're doing with our live show. It needs to be honest. It needs to be uh, uh, us. And you're Mantis. You were Mantis. You will be Mantis. So all you need to do is be Mantis. You write <laughs> like Mantis and you play like Mantis. I do what I do, Tony does what he does, and that's who we are. We don't need to try and copy ourselves. We don't need to try and pretend it's 1981 and do another album like that. We don't need to do anything, and we don't need to prove ourselves to anybody. We just need to make some music for the fans that want us to make it and play it. That's all we need to do. So that's what he did. And when, once we had 
the shape of all the songs that we thought, right, they sound good. We then sent all of those uh, files up to Abaddon. He went straight into a studio, recorded all the drums, analog, then digitized them, sent them back to Portugal. Then I flew to Portugal, to Jeff's, put all the bass down, and then we sat and finished off all the lyrical ideas, all the themes. And then a day and a half, I threw all the vocal down. And, uh, and, and in fact, two of the songs, Metal We Bleed, I think, and Dying Flash, they the, the demo vocals. I didn't, he said, they're, they're, I don't want to touch them. So they're just the vocals I did for the demo. Oh, cool. And we left them as they were. But it all flowed again. It all flowed really quickly. Uh, and um, and I think I think that we'd underestimated the fact that although we didn't get together as as, a, as rehearsal and throw ideas around, we'd actually done nothing but tour for two and a half years. So we'd actually done all of that because we'd been on the road. So we'd played all the stuff and talked about all the stuff, and all the ideas were already there. So all we needed to do was dip our hand in the bag and pull them out. We already had them. Even though we hadn't been planning an album, even though we had, had no ulterior goal, when we were called upon to do it, we already had everything ready. And I guess that's probably experience and age and, and that we've been non-stop touring, so we were more than ready to record, you know. So, it, again, it seemed quite easy. And uh, I came back to the UK, uh, Manchester's mastered it, and uh, he delivered the, the songs and I delivered the artwork at the same time. Went off to Rome, um, shot video over two days, came back and edited that, and then they had everything. So I think the whole thing took maybe two months from start to finish. Wow. And done. Um, and, but I, I, for me, that was part of the impetus, you know, because we have a particular passion and a particular energy. There's a live band, and I wanted to capture that somehow and put it on the album so that when, list, when the people listened to it, they felt that they were part of it, that they felt some kind of energy, some kind of passion coming off it, that it's not fake. We didn't do an album just to make some books. We, we haven't polished it like a turd to make it all shiny. We've just, this is what we felt, this is what we've done, and there it is, and you take it or leave it, but it, it's as honest as we can make it, and it's definitely us. So, you know, what have some of the early reactions been like? I mean, did, have you played any of the new material out live yet? Well, we, we, we've only done all this at Tennis because up to the point uh, where we did the last show before the release of the album, which was last Friday, we, it hadn't been out. So we didn't want to you know, uh, we didn't want to push anything out. We, because I had this thing as like, you know, with streaming and with <clears throat> people don't have patience anymore. <laughs> and so I didn't want them to hear, I personally, I didn't want them to hear anything for the album until the day it was released. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in Nuclear Blast, they have a system, so they wanted a, a video, then they wanted a lyrical video. So the first song we went out was a four-minute edit of Dying Flash, which is a seven-minute song with a solo. But I use the four minute edit because there is no solo and it's very not what people were expecting and so i managed to cause a huge reaction people either went what the fuck is this this isn't <laughs> what i you know and they reacted really strangely but uh, because they expected us to put out some the same old shit same old old school shit we would have and that would have been really easy to do but i didn't want to make it easy i wanted people to actually See if they had been listening to what we've been saying. See if they would embrace who we, what we were trying to do, uh, and um, and that's like a, a part of our identity, you know. So, you know, the, when we put obviously a tennis out the lyrical video, which followed that, of course, then people thought, oh, okay, right now I get it, sort of thing. And dying flight in context of the album is different, very like not like any of the other tracks, but it is part of the whole thing. And it's got a context when you hear it in the album. But the only song I thought we did it, Silverado with Danzig and Ministry uh, in California there. Then we did it Silac in Lyon. And we did it in Sardinia. And we did it in Metal Days Festival in Slovenia. Was always the talent the title track. But what was really strange was that... Um, we played it at uh, Silverado and people had heard it, but it was just out. But when we went and played in Sardinia and Slovenia and just in France, they were jumping around and everybody was singing the song. Everybody was singing it. Oh, cool. And I was, I, it was the most bizarre thing, thinking, hang on, the album's not out yet. How do you all know it? But of course, the, I guess the video. So if there's a, what is the reaction to 
uh, the album, which has been amazingly positive over the last day since it's released, and, and messages constantly, um, is that, you know, the, the audiences, once uh, the, the lyrical video is that the audiences have been singing the song in amongst the set, so that's got to mean good, hasn't it? That's got to be a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought if we play it and they all stand with their with arms folded, we're in trouble, but they weren't. They were all, yeah, reacting to it, so it, it's brilliant. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. So, so Tony, when you go on your tour that's coming up, are you still going to play Metal Messiah out there? Ah, yes, exactly. Well, you know, um, <laughs> funny enough, you, you know, I wanted to creep some of that stuff in. And we thought we thought about that, about putting the stuff, because the Empire stuff was so amazing. But what I've, uh, what I've got is I've got some Atom Craft shows coming up. So what I'm going to do with those shows is we're going to put a whole cross-section in. So because I wrote Metal Messiah with Jeff, of course, you know, but... It's for you guys, you know, mm -hmm. for you and for the, and particularly for you, but for for Metal Messiah, that was my my salute and my thanks to you guys. But uh, you know, I haven't had the opportunity since the Venom thing started. So because I'm booking some Atom Craft shows, I thought rather than just go and play Atom Craft stuff, we're going to play a whole combination of things that people haven't heard, and we're going to reintroduce some Empire stuff. So oh, nice. you will be hearing it live. Of course, we can't let that go. That's part of uh, who we are. Okay, you know. It's close to us. I just got to make sure, Tony. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So, Tony, so tell us a little bit about this tour that you got coming up now. Well, we we, we begin the world tour on the 1st of September, and we start in Philadelphia, which uh, takes us uh, uh, all the way up the East Coast, uh, Eastern Seaboard, and we uh, up through Boston, and then we go uh, as far up, I think, as uh, Montreal, Quebec City. We come back down through Toronto. Detroit, Chicago, we go out to uh, Seattle, Vancouver, we play right down uh, till we get level with Texas, we come back through Texas, we go into Florida, and then we come back up, finishing in Atlanta, and I think uh, Pittsburgh, possibly, and then I think we fly, yeah, that's about five weeks we're going to be doing in the U.S., um, ending in, in, in uh, with a special end of uh, tour kind of party thing, which we're not announcing until mm -hmm. we finish... Uh, we play the Gramercy here in New York, and then the next day we're going to announce the end of tour thing, where it's going to happen and what's going to happen. Well, we're trying to make that quite special with some guests and stuff. And then we fly back to the UK. We've got a series of UK dates, uh, and then right now we're looking at expanding that. Um, into the new year, we go, down, we go to Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, ta Taiwan, and then uh, we come back and do another <coughs> big push on the European tour, uh, and then we're good to go back to the U.S. again because, you know, I think in the old days, uh, the band just did not tour the U.S. And these days, you know, uh, I think the U.S. feels sometimes they get left out. Um, and to us, it's, it's really important, you know, particularly France for me and the United States because I think, uh, inclusive of Canada, of course, as well, because... Um, but, you know, we used to go on tour and we'd always pass through France when we were in Europe, but never really play shows in France. And I was thinking, why are we always passing through France and not <laughs> playing in France? And so one of my big things was to make sure we were playing shows in France. And also because America, you know, there's visa issues and it's expensive and mm -hmm. all of that. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. And, and you know, this is like going to be our fourth or fifth uh, trip there, probably third, third maybe, or fourth with uh, Venomy. But, uh, um, you know, I, for me and Jeff, you know, over the years. And, and each time it's been relatively easy, you know, to apply for our visas, get our visas, get our P1s, and then come and play. So it's no mystery. So when I constantly read a band's on its way and then oh they've been turned back or oh they had visa issues or something it's like that's just about that's just bad organization you know mm -hmm. if you want to go on vacation you book your plane ticket you book your luggage and you go if you fuck it up you because you didn't think or you didn't book in time then you've got a problem so i i i i want to make sure that uh, that we're coming all the time and that you know the american fans for me, it's like we could play Poughkeepsie and have 10 people, or we could play, you know, Los Angeles and have a 1,000 people. We'd go to Texas and have 10,000 people. But we wouldn't favor one over the other, 
you know, each one is of its own importance and each show is very different. But 10 fans here, 100 fans there or 12,000 fans somewhere else, they're still fans mm -hmm. and they still deserve. They've invested in you. They've been loyal to you and you're important to them. So they deserve to see you. So that's why for every New York, we'll play a St. Louis or somewhere or a bar up in Denver, if that's what they want. You know, it's like, you know, to me, we don't look at the size of the venues. It's not about our ego. It's just about the music and the fans and some of the best shows we've had. I mean, we played, you know, the Gramercy Theatre before and Manhattan was fantastic. But we played St. Vitus, which is like our second home, which is a small club in Brooklyn there. But there's something quite special about being there, you know, and uh, the proximity you have to the audience and, uh, you know, getting on stage, you have to go through the audience. Then you have to come off through the audience to come off stage after you perform. So, you know, that puts you right in touch with your fan base and they can talk to you immediately. And that's what I love. That's what I love. You know, there's a there's a special atmosphere that's created between you and the fans during the concert and uh, and that's why I love bringing us to America apart from the fact that it's an amazing country with uh, an amazing uh, you know landscape but uh, you know the warmth of the American people that have been to us the American fans has been so embracing that we you know we think they deserve as much of us as we can give because they've been denied so much for so long from this band so it's quite important so it's, it's brilliant to be starting off a world tour in america just like the first tour we did was america you know it was important to start there you know and this the album came out today and i see you got yours yes you know it was great <laughs> i went funny enough i went to a walmart in niagara um and uh, i had a look around and um, and they didn't have anything, and I thought, oh, bollocks. And I, I was thinking, wow, well, I was hoping I would come across one. And then when I got to Windsor, uh, of course, there's no HMVs anymore and Tower and all that, but I, I, I knew there was Sun Records, so I thought, well, I'll have a look in there. I looked through the CD section, there was nothing there, and I was like, ah, oh, a bit gutted. And then I asked a young girl on the counter, um, and she looked at the computer, and then she went, oh, I'll be back in a minute, and she went across to the CD section. And I thought, oh, she's just looking, but that means they did have one. And then right in front of me was the vinyls, and I thought, oh, well, maybe they had the vinyl. And the first one I flicked over, there it was. And I just thought, it's $40, but I have to get it back. <laughs> so uh, it was amazing. It was amazing to be able to get it. Because also, Jet, like you just said, for me, it's like, you know, I used to live in Windsor, Ontario, and I was a, a guy, a young guy, and uh, playing music and dreaming of making albums. And and here I am in Windsor, and, and here it is a Venom Ink album. You know, it just, I don't know, it all seemed quite special, you know, so it was perfect. It was perfect. And I thought it was funny when Jeff said that he would sign it for you. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> and I said, well, someone said to me, are you going to get it signed? I went, well, I don't know, but I guess I should ask. And then he comes on and goes, I'll sign it for you if you want. It's very kind. Very kind of him, so yeah. <laughs> You know, and then someone was going, oh, you had to buy your own album. I went, absolutely, you've got to invest in yourself. I mean, you, <laughs> and, you know, based on the principle that how can I expect anybody else to buy the album if I'm not prepared to buy well, it? Well, plus so. it was kind of cool because you bought it when you were home, you know. It's yes, like you exactly. were, and it was like you were saying when you were a kid, you were so excited to buy other people's albums. Now you're so yeah. excited to be home and buy your own. <laughs> I know, I know. And just think to be in, to be in a mall where I used to go... And when it was just like a few handful of stores and now it's a huge mall and to, to know that I used to go in there to look at records and now I'm actually buying my own in there was, <laughs> was uber special. Very, very cool. Very cool. I hope it's not a shit album because if it's shit, I'll be so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony, what sites do you guys have out there where people can follow the band and see what dates you are playing and all that kind of stuff? Well, we have our official site, of course, which is uh, www.venominc.com, and that's like, got, uh, you know, everything is updated on there. Um, but, you know, we use the social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter. We're on Venom uh, um, uh, underscore uh, Inc. Uh, Twitter we're on. Um, uh, we have Facebook site. There's an official Facebook page, Venom Inc. on Facebook. And then uh, there's Tony Dolan and Tony Dolan 2, which are my two pages I have, uh, which I try and communicate with everybody as much as I can. 
um, and Jeff Dunn has a page, and, and, and Anthony Bray, Abaddon has a page, so, you know, we're open to chat. Jeff doesn't do so much the chatting thing on, on his Facebook and his social media. He's not he's not a keyboard type of guy. He's a reader, but he's not a type. <laughs> um, but, you know, myself and Abaddon in particular, we... We like to chat as much as we can, and every, you know, I think, I think there's probably on my personal pages something getting close to eight thousand, nine thousand people. But every single person who's come in there, I've spoken to every single person, because I think it's quite important that at least I say hi and make a, a contact with. And if people want to come and ask questions, you know, um, I, I, I try, I, you know, sometimes we want to have conversations, and I can't, but I try and respond to everybody, everybody who messages me. I do. If they have a particular question, I try and share on that as well because I work on the principle, and it is genuine, I work on the principle that uh, Lemmy was a huge hero of mine. And if I could have woke up every morning and said, morning Lemmy, how are you doing if I saw him online? And all he said was, I'm cool, how are you? <laughs> I'd be I'd be set for the rest of my life, you know. <laughs> so I realise how important it is and, and um, so, you know, uh, yeah, you can hit us everywhere you want to hit us and, and keep updated. All right, well, there you have it. The new Venom Inc. album, Ave, is out now on Nuclear Blaster Records. And, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. And hopefully I'll be able to catch you guys up in Boston. No, awesome. Yeah, and you're my special guest. And it's been too long, and I <laughs> hope you can get to see the show. If you can't, I won't hold it against you. Thank Probably you. Probably not speak to you for a few months. But other than that, I'll be, uh, that'll be all good. But I'm dying for you to see the show, to experience it. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the album and, and talk about, you know, the, the fan base. I, I'd just like to end by saying, you know, uh, there is... Kronos is still out there doing his thing and so are we. Uh, this is not divisional, this is not divisive this is not about one person against another person or choosing one thing against another. If you have a preference, you have a preference. Nobody's taking that away from you. We're only adding it. And think of it this way you have uh, twice the opportunity to see all of the players who are involved in this great legacy which we call Venom and, uh, and think of it like this. You know, if your favourite thing to eat is ice cream would you like a spoonful or a bathtub full? Just think, a bathtub full's better. You can always leave out bits if you feel a bit sick. <laughs> and that's what we are. We're more. We're more than less. And so embrace it all and just enjoy it. Keep an open mind and like what you like. And if you don't like what you don't like, that's cool too, you know. Some people like coffee. Some people like tea. But you have a choice. That's the beautiful thing about life. <laughs>